Lord, there is. Thou knowest thyself, and thou knowest where we are concerned, the very special need that is related to this time. It is the need of being freed from familiarity. Freed from common acceptance. From tradition. From habit. From just doing something as something which is done amongst Christians. And the need of seeing in a new way, with a new impact upon us, what this means. We can have this service and close the conference with it. But it could be the most telling thing of all. It could be something that we never, never forget. And that plows deep into our very being, changes our whole conception. Well, Lord, if you really feel this is necessary, see it to be necessary, then do it. And to make this indeed a sacred, a memorable hour. Oh, may there indeed be in the realm of the Spirit a tasting of thee, thou living bread. We pray, cleanse our hearts now. Do in every way, get us rightly related and adjusted to what we are about to do. Hear us, answer us, for thy name's sake. Amen. I shall make the word that I have to say as brief as possible so as not to overload this time with words. But I trust that the Lord will enable that however brief it's an eternal word something that will go deeper than the words and the ideas and reach us in an inward way. Will you please turn to scriptures which of course are so familiar in this connection. From John chapter 6, John's Gospel chapter 6, at verse 51 I am the living bread which came down out of heaven if any man eat of this bread he shall live forever Yea, and the bread which I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove one with another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus therefore said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have not life in yourselves. 
He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, true meat, and my blood is true drink. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood abideth in me, and I in him. First letter to the Corinthians, chapter 10. At verse 16, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a communion of the blood of Christ? The loaf which we break, is it not a communion of the body of Christ? Seeing that we who are many are one loaf, one body. For we all partake of the one loaf. The cup, is it not a participation of the blood of Christ. The loop, is it not a participation of the body of Christ? Participation of One loaf. We will speak of the loaf first. Of the body first. Here it is precisely stated that there is an identity between the true believer and believers and Christ. It is a common participation of the one with the other. Here is a, of course, spiritual body, not a physical body a spiritual entity. And the statement is here, here is as utter as any statement could possibly be. The context, as you notice, is that which we've heard already, the eating of flesh offered to idols. And the Apostle says that those who do that become participants with idols, with demons. With demons. They are participants with demons. They imbibe what is demoniacal. They take into themselves and become constituted in their very being by what they eat of the table of idols. It's a very utter thing. And so the, the Apostle says of believers, when they eat of the table of the Lord, 
in a spiritual way they are imbibing, taking into their very constitution. What is Christ? Becoming constituted by Christ. Now you know that we are constituted by what we eat. First of all, our very measure is determined by our eating. Our continuance. Stop eating and you will shrink away. You'll just grow less and less until there's nothing left. We are because we eat. Very simple language, but this goes to the heart. We are because we eat. And then, very largely, our character, disposition, is by what we eat. You see people who are eating too much of one thing something that comes about where they are concerned. If you eat too much canned food, your skin will become parchment. People will know what you feed on. And what is true in that connection, of course, is true in others, that we become what we eat. The mystery, of course, of the transmutation of our food into ourselves may never be solved by the best medical expert, but the fact remains. The fact remains. And so in order to get certain constitutional values, you eat certain things. The old the old idea, I expect the truth in it is, for brain power, eat plenty of fish. And for this or that particular constitutional need, you should eat certain things. And those certain things make you, both mentally as well as physically, what you are. Well, I need not labor that. Everybody knows that. But that is what is here. What you take in becomes you. That's your constitution. Now, the word is saying quite clearly that in Christ becoming to us our staple food, our basic food, Christ becomes our constitution, our life, our nature, our disposition, our behavior, our temper, our everything. It becomes Christ living in us. This is what is meant by participating of Christ. It is a union which, if you can get in between your food and what you think tomorrow, well, you have worked a miracle. You stop feeding and you will subsequently, sooner or later, stop thinking. And when you express your thoughts, you are only really expressing what you had to eat a few days before. You can't get in between those two things. It's a fact. It's identity, isn't it? Between food and being, food and life. 
Now the Lord Jesus is just saying this. The union between himself is like that. That he becomes our constitution, our nature, our disposition, our expression, our conduct, our behavior. He just becomes that. The basis value of our life. There are other metaphors, of course, of this. The husband and wife, and they twain shall become one flesh. One flesh. In the deepest reality of their relationship, there is an affinity. And it is so real, if it's a proper kind of relationship, a God-constituted relationship the one cannot live without the other. Half as God if one goes. There's, there's a gap. There's a vacuum which can't be filled if it's the right kind of thing. This union between Christ and the believer is said in the scriptures to be like that. And for me or you to be separated even temporarily or in sense from the Lord Jesus means that, well, everything's gone out of our life. We've lost, we've lost the real meaning of life. A common Participation. It says here twice over. A common participation in the body of Christ. It cannot describe it. it. Cannot describe it. But here's the statement. And dear friends, would not this revolutionize what we call the Holy Communion? the Lord's Supper, the sacrament, or whatever you call it, it would completely revolutionize our conception and idea if when we came to this table we were reminded, really reminded, and reminded ourselves to this position. I am testifying to the fact that there is such a union between me and the Lord Jesus and me that he and I have become one entity and to divide us is to well, take our very life away. That's simple in language. We are learning it in life. But what we are talking about now is not our Christian life and what we are learning is what we mean when we come to this table. It's not a ceremony. It's not a bit of ritual. It's not something that Christians do, a part of the Christian creed and performance. It is a testimony to one of the most profound and wonderful facts in this universe that between us and Christ and Christ and us a constitutional union. Oh, I, I do wish that everybody really got hold of this because, you see, there's so many who think they can give up Christianity. Give up the Christian life. And they think sometimes that they will. They, they feel tempted, to, as they say, to give it all up. To give it all up. Well, you may as well go down the sea and drown yourself if this thing is real. Because you're going to give yourself up. You're going to commit suicide. You're going to take your own life. No, you can't do it. You just cannot do it. If you really do know what it means to be a true born-again Christian, you cannot say, I'm going to resign. I'm going to give it up. 
just cannot think like that. You know quite well that you're going to tear, tear the very heart out of your being to do anything like that. And some people who do get into darkness and seem and accept the suggestion that the Lord has left them. They are in hell already. They are in hell already. Their heaven has gone. Their life has gone. Everything they've got has gone. That out wandering in desolation. Isn't that true? So real is a true participation with Christ. Now we follow that through. That's the body. The body, of course, is the, the vehicle of the Spirit, the Spirit of Christ. And pass over to the cup. To the cup. The body is union with his humanity. The cup is the union with the life in the humanity. And what the Lord Jesus said about the cup was that in this common participation we enter into a covenant. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. A covenant of blood. And we ought to know where that came from and what that means. A covenant of blood. This is recognized in other than Christian realms. Probably it came from, originally, from the Semites. We don't know whether it did come from somewhere else and was taken over, taken over by the Semites, by Abram and others, or whether it started there. But the fact is that it is well nigh universally recognized, especially in the East. And uh, Henry Clay Trumbull has investigated that and given us a lot of insight. He says, this very thing, this covenant of blood amongst the Arabs, works in this way. Two Arabs, who are not naturally related, want to enter into a fellowship of life, to bind themselves to one another, and to commit each one to the other absolutely. And so they institute a covenant and they meet and they bear each one bears his arm. And each opens an artery. And then they put the arm, arms together at the point of the opening where each one's blood flows to the other. It's a covenant in blood and the terms are now. You have my very life in you. Wherever you go, you carry my life with you. And I carry yours. And whatever is done to you is done to me. Whatever is done to me is done to you. If anybody speaks against me, you say at once, look here, you're speaking against me. Speak against me, not against him. You speak against me. If anyone does me an injury, you say, look here, that injury is done to me. I am him. Is that right, grammar? I am he. I am he. We have the same blood in us. 
we are identical by a covenant in blood so that as long as we live the one lives for the other we are each other though we be thousands of miles apart that's the covenant says crumble amongst the Arabs made in blood now where it originated again doesn't matter but that is what the Lord Jesus is saying this cup is a new covenant in my blood a covenant made between us a covenant demands two parties I make it with you, but you enter into it with me. And because of my blood, which is my life given, wherever you go, you represent me. What happens to you, happens to me, affects me. And so in reverse, if the Lord is a sailor, it, it hurts us, it goes to us. Anything is said about the Lord, why it, it touches us acutely and keenly. So great is the union, he that touches you touches the apple of my eye. And this, of course, if we were expanding it, is the real meaning of the anointing touch not mine anointing. The anointing means that he has committed himself to the anointed and touch the anointed and you touch the Lord. And David, even when Saul was hunting him, one day cut off the fringe of Saul's garment and it says, and David's heart smote him. Dare I touch the Lord's anointing? Even though he is persecuting me, that anointing puts us in a different realm. Well, I don't want to say too much, add too many words. What I'm getting at, here we are. Does this table really mean this to us when we come to it today? Such a covenant relationship in blood that we share one life have one common participation one common concern I, I expect it's true of you all but you know we can get into a habit and a custom can't we, can we have the Lord's table and go away and that's the part of the service be it morning or evening we carry out perhaps once a week or more or less often less frequently but all oh, that we might be in the presence of the reality. You see, this is a fellowship in the blood, a fellowship in the body. It means on the one side, the fellowship of his sufferings. Participation in the sufferings of Christ. You've heard much about this. But this covenant also means a fellowship in security. The covenant makes us secure. If Christ can be slain and brought to an end, then we can. If he cannot, then we cannot. In his blood we are secure. I don't know, I'm not going to open the subject as to whether we can repudiate the covenant. Repudiate the covenant. Trample underfoot the blood of the sacrifice and count it. Thing, not and shame. Well, that, leave it. But while you and I abide faithful to the covenant, we are secure no matter what the enemies are, the forces against us. Fellowship, participation in his suffering, participation in his security. So glad that the Lord Jesus is in heaven, aren't you? Is in heaven. 
You know, we talk about the ascension, but it's not often spoken of in the New Testament. It does say he when he ascended up on high, but it more often speaks of his being received up into glory, which means that he could be received up. Heaven could be open to him because he'd done everything that heaven required. Heaven was satisfied, and so he could be received through the everlasting door. A mighty reception it was. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up the everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory, the Lord, mighty in battles? He is the King of glory, a mighty welcome for him. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in the heavens. Secure. No heavens other heavens can reach him and no other earth can reach him and hell cannot reach him. And we are seated with him in that security if in you secure in Christ in the blood of the covenant and then participation in his glory in his glory if we suffer with him we shall be glorified together with him. It's all this with, 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 mighty with. And that's the word that stands over this table. With him. In the very depth of our being, in our very constitution, in our conduct, in our service, and ultimately through our suffering. In his glory, participate. 